Turn with me to James, the second chapter, please. James chapter 2. And we shall begin reading with the 14th verse. James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt I know, O vain men, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? Now I want to read Weymouth's translation. What good is it, my brethren, the 14th verse, what good is it, my brethren, if a man professes to have faith and yet his actions do not correspond. Or in verse 22, speaking of Abraham, Weymouth translation, you notice that his faith was cooperating with his actions. And that by his actions, his faith was perfected. Now that's a little clear to us. King James translation is a little blind to us. Some folks read this, you know, and think he's talking about salvation, but I want you to notice it isn't right in the sinners. He said, what doth it profit my brethren? He's writing to folks that's already saved. Yeah, no, no salvation is not under consideration whatsoever. He's writing to people who are believers, who are Christians. What doth it profit my brethren? He's writing to brethren. And so he's not talking about works for salvation. That's beside the subject here entirely. He's talking about the fact that your faith without correspondent actions won't work for you even though you are a believer. One of the gravest mistakes that many believers make is to confess their faith in the word of God and at the same time contradict their confession by wrong actions. Weymouth has it translated correctly. It's best for us to get our mind off of works, but he's because he's talking about actions here. We say that we're trusting God the Father for finances, and at the same time are worrying and fretting about how we're going to pay our bills. Can't you see there's not any correspondent action there? That's what he's saying. One minute we confess that the word of God is true and that no word from God can be forfeited, that he must keep his word with us and that we know that he will and the very next moment we repudiate everything we say by wrong actions. Your actions have to correspond with your believing if you're going to receive from God. Now James tells us in the very first chapter of James and in the 22nd verse, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Or as the margin reads, deluding your own self. Now we have a lot of self-deluded people. They lay it off on the devil or someone else, but really they've deluded themselves. 
because they are not actors or doers of the word. The actions of a doer of the word coincide with his confession. Now Jesus said in the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel, the 24th through the 26th verse, Jesus said these words, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell and great was the fall thereof. Now you know most folks miss what Jesus said entirely. I said they missed what Jesus said entirely. Most folks said, well, now Jesus is the rock. When you build on Jesus, you'll never fall. And you see people all around about them that goes down when the storm comes. We're seeing it on every side. When the storms of life come, we see folks that's going down. Now why are they, even though they are... They, Christ, of course, is the rock, and they began on him. Well, the trouble is, they're not doers. Now, notice what Jesus said. Whosoever shall hear these sayings of mine and do them. He's still talking about a person practicing doing the word, believing the word, and then his actions correspond with what he believes. That's what he's talking about. Now, I want you to notice something. He said that the same rains descended, the same storm, the same floods, the same wind came upon both of these houses. If it had been the wind, if it had been the rain, the flood, or the storm that destroyed it, it would have destroyed both houses. That's not what destroyed it. The fact that one of them was a doer of the word and the other wasn't. Is the thing that put one over and caused the other to fail. Now isn't that right? Praise God. It isn't the storms of life that defeats us. If the storm defeated us, it would defeat all of us. Why is it that some people face the same storm and they're not defeated and they don't fall like this house? Because they are doers of the word. They act upon God's word. Praise the Lord. Where the other... Though they may be a Christian, though they may be thoroughly saved, yet they do not have corresponding actions with their faith. And when the test of sickness comes, they're laid low. While other folks, though the test of sickness may come upon them, they stand their ground and refuse to be sick. Praise God. Just refuse to take it. You see, you don't have to because that uh, storm of sickness doesn't belong to you after all. Amen. It's because one is a doer of the word and one is not a doer of the word. Yes, the storms of life come upon all of us. It may be in the guise of sickness. It may be in the guise of financial uh, difficulty. It, it may be some other test or some other trial. The winds blow. The rain descends. The flood comes. But oh, bless God, he who is a doer of the word can through it all smile, praise God, and hold fast to his confession of faith, for he knows that God cannot fail. Amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord. Now so many who profess Christ and who declare that they believe the word of God to be true from Genesis to Revelation. Or sort of like the old colored preacher said, bless God, I believe it's from revolutions through generations. Well, they believe the Bible's true from Genesis to Revelation. And they say it with a great deal of unction. And yet so many of those very same people are not doers of the word. They 
are talkers about the word. There's a difference between talkers about the word and doers of the word. They have mentally assented and agreed in their heads that the word of God is absolutely true. But it doesn't do them any good because they're not making it their own. The way you make God's word your own is to act upon it. Do what it says. When I trust in the word with all my heart, and you know the Bible said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. And you know the only way in the world to trust in the Lord is to trust his word. You cannot trust in the Lord without trusting his word. Amen. Because God and his word are one, just like you and your word is one. If your word's not any good, then you're not any good. If God's word is no good, then he's no good. But thank God his word is good, isn't it? And, and he watches over his word to keep it. Praise God. Uh, Jeremiah, the first chapter, the 12th verse, has it. God said, I will hasten my word to perform it. King James translation in the margin reads, I watch over my word to perform it. But you see, if you don't take that word to be yours, he doesn't have anything to make good in your life. He wants to make it good in your life. And he wants you to have what his word promises. But if you don't act upon his word, then he doesn't have anything to make good in your life. So when I trust in the word with all of my heart and stop leaning, upon human reasonings stop looking to people for deliverance then I have corresponding actions with my faith my actions are in perfect fellowship then with my confession of faith now it's taken some of us a long time and it'll take others even longer because they have so been uh, walking in the wrong pathway and their minds are so cluttered up with human reasonings until it'll take them a little while to renew their minds with the word of God. So that they will have corresponding actions with their confession of faith. Until there is corresponding actions there will be continual failure in your life. Now I can confess and I can say just as boldly and just as loudly as I please that God is the strength of my life and the Bible says he is, you know, and that I believe the Bible and at the same time go on talking about my weaknesses and my inability and my lack of faith and I'll be defeated and will continually fail because there's no corresponding action there. Isn't that true? That's absolutely the truth. You see, I'm resorting to human methods or means rather than trusting the Lord utterly. And so that brings confusion to my spirit and that brings weakness and failure into my life. There's just one thing for us to do and that's to turn to God's word simply and wholeheartedly. Accept what God's word says and then act upon it. I remember 30 years ago on the bed of affliction, I... Uh, I didn't know about healing at first. And I didn't know that I could be healed. And I went through a sort of a state there a while of sort of blaming God. So many people do that. I said to the Lord, Lord, you know, you've been better to others than you have to me. Now I said to the Lord, Lord, there's Owen Smith. I started the school with him in the first grade. I knew him before I started the school. We lived in a block of his house. Now I know, of course, that I'm saved now and I've been a sinner, but I never was as mean as Owen Smith. And I said, Lord, he never has been sick. 
that I know anything about. And here I've been sick all my life, afflicted with a heart condition, never able to run and play and do things that other children and boys do. And here at 15 years of age, I've become totally bedfast. Now Owen Smith's not any older than I am. He may be a few months older. He's, probably, he's 16 by now. But I said to the Lord, Lord, I know exactly where he is. Without being off of the bed, I can tell you just about where he is. He's standing around right downtown right now in front of coffee drugstore. And his pockets is full of money. And he's got good clothes. And he's got health. I don't have health, never had health. If I was up, but we didn't even have good clothes. And I, don't, I had no money. And I know how he got his money. They're not supposed to, but they're gambling there in the back of Coffee's drugstore. I know, I've been back there. I didn't gamble. But I know what they're doing. And I know that's the way he got his money. Because you see, he's sort of... He's gambling some, making some money, but then he's working also with them to get folks in there so they can fleece them. So you see now, here I've got to die. I can't live, got no health, no money, no clothes, not real good clothes like he's got. And I never was as mean as him. And I've got to die, the doctor said. That don't look right, does it? And I felt so sorry for myself until I lay there a half a day and wouldn't even talk to God. I wouldn't even speak to him. Well, finally, about six o'clock in the evening, Mother came around again to pat me and comfort me and to sympathize with me. And I said to Mama, Mama, would it help any if I wanted to get well? Well, she said, son, that's about half of the battle. I said, bless God, I got half of it won then. Because I sure want to. <laughs> then I decided I better try to do something about the other half of the battle, and I knew that was between me and God. So I decided I better get back on speaking turn. He'd be in on speaking turn with me all the time. It was me, you see. And I began to pray, but he wouldn't hear me. I didn't make that connection. Finally, I, 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 I began to see what was the wrong. You see, I'd promised the Lord some months before, after being saved. The first time I picked up the Bible, I say pick it up, I had him to bring it to me actually, and I looked at it, and it said Holy Bible. It said Old Testament, New Testament, and I had enough sense to know that the new took the place of the old or whatever wouldn't be new and the other would be old. And so I said, well, I may not be here 10 minutes from now because the doctor said I might die in a minute. So I'll start in with the new. You must understand me, I read the old and still read it since then because we learned much. But I wanted to find out what he had to say in the new covenant. So I started in with Matthew, and I said to the Lord, Now, dear Lord, I shut my eyes and said, Now, dear Lord, before I ever read the word, I've read the Bible before, but it didn't mean anything to him. I didn't know you were supposed to understand it, so I didn't try to understand it. Before I got saved, you see, this is the first time I've looked at it since I've been saved. And it just looked different on the outside when you read really it saved. Now, I promise you that I'll never doubt anything I read in your word. And I promise you, as soon as I understand it, that the minute I understand it, I'll put it into practice. In other words, I'll be a doer of the words what it's telling me, see. Well, I started in here with Matthew, and I read Matthew 1, Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6. And I got down to the end of that sixth chapter and I got hung up. Because you see, I'd promised him that I'd never doubt anything I read there. And you see, I read in the 25th verse of Matthew 6, where he said, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. 
what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto your stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Therefore take no thought for the morrow. Another translation there reads, Therefore be not anxious. In fact, the translation I was reading said, Therefore be not anxious about tomorrow. And I was reading a little footnote there, and it said, Don't worry or fret. And it referred me to Philippians 4, 6, where again the King James translation says, Be careful for nothing. That's a little blind to us. Amplified translation reads, Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Well, here God's telling me not to worry. Here God's telling me not to be anxious or to fret. And I've promised him when I read it and understand it, I'll do it. But I'm not only about bound on the bed of affliction and almost dead, but I just about worried myself the rest of the way to death. You see, my grandmother and mother were world champion warriors. And they just unconsciously taught me to worry. I'll tell you, there never was, even though I was a kid, one more to worry than I. Now, people talk about a habit to get rid of. I want to tell you the hardest sin I ever gave up is the sin of worry. Why, somebody said, that's not a sin. It's a sin, my brother, sister, to disobey God's word. Are you hearing me? Sure, that's a sin. And it's much worse habit than the tobacco habit. Don't shout me down now just because I'm preaching real good. Much worse. You see, tobacco will just half kill you, but worry will kill you. A fellow that uses tobacco is just half alive while he lives. He can't taste anything because he's got that terrible taste in his mouth and his sense of taste is dull. And he can't smell anything because he stinks so bad himself all the time. So you know if he could smell, he would quit using the nasty stuff. Well, then that's true. Amen, that's the truth. And he really doesn't enjoy life. He just goes through about half dead. Doctors admit that themselves. But worry will kill you. Amen, all together. I know the doctor told me, you see, I remember one thing got me in this kind of a shape. You see, one of the doctors came out there and told me, he said, uh, and talked to me about 45 minutes one time. He just took off 45 minutes from his noon hour, that is, and he went to lunch. I didn't know he was coming. He had been on the case very long. One of the other doctors, old Dr. Mathers, on the case had died. And so they got, brother, uh, they got Dr. Robinson. And so he stopped by one day and he said to me, son... Has any of the other doctors, he knew there'd been four more, he was the fifth doctor on the case. He said, has any of the other doctors ever told you just exactly what's wrong with you? I said, no, sir. Well, now, he said, I'll tell you, I, I'm, I'm a little different maybe than some doctors, but I believe in telling people exactly what's wrong with them. Now, he said, I'm going to tell you exactly what's wrong with you. You know, of course, you have a heart condition. And so he said, well, now, you got to remember, this is 1933. Of course, doctors know more nowadays than they did then. So he took a, 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 a prescription pad from his pocket and he had written on that seven names. They were medical names and so I couldn't understand them. I mean, even when he said them, I didn't understand them. 
He said up till now, there are seven serious organic heart troubles known to medical science. Now he said, when I said organic, I mean in the organs of the heart itself. He held up his fist, doubled his fist up. He said, say for instance, my fist is your heart. I mean in the organ. He said, there's, there's trouble in the muscles around the heart. I'm not talking about that. There's hardening of the arteries. I'm not talking about that. He said, there's a kidney trouble that'll cause, uh, affect the heart. But I'm not talking about that. Some people have a nervous heart. I'm not talking about that. Indigestion, some folks, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll affect the heart and a lot of other things. But he said, I'm talking about in the organ itself, the heart itself. Now he said, out of these seven, I had two of them. And he went on to tell me I was born that way. For instance, he said, you have a deformed heart. Now, for instance, he said, you've seen a child with a deformed foot, maybe a club foot. I said, yes, sir. Well, he said, that's what we call a deformed foot. Now, your heart is deformed. It isn't normal. And I also asked him why, when I drank a glass of cold water, it didn't go straight to my stomach, but spread out over the left side of my chest. And he said, you're also deformed throughout your entire chest area. And then this condition has gone on so long, it took blood from the end of my finger, and it, it looked the color of a pale orange and was real watery-like. And so he said the white corpuscles destroyed the red, red blood corpuscles faster than they could do anything about it, and medical science could do anything about it. In fact, he said there's just no need to even try. And then my body had become practically totally paralyzed. At times, I was just completely. And then I'd get to where I could use my arms a little bit. So he said to me, Sonny, he said, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. There, there's not anything, any medicine to reach you, no operation. There's nothing can be done for you. And he said, uh, you just go down the middle of the road and stay ready to go. And the doctor took me by the hand, patted me, said, son, stay ready to go. Well, he told me all he knew, you see. And I appreciate him for being frank and honest with me. I told him so later when I was in the office after I was raised up. But anyway, he went on to say to me, now I realize you might say, well, what are you... You, can, you, you couldn't do much here in bed, but he said, I tell you, don't worry about anything. Worry is the worst thing on your heart. He said, just don't worry. Don't get mad. He said, you might lose your temper and just die instantly. Don't worry. Don't get mad. He said, in fact, you see, my window, well, I, they had me laid where I could look out the window, you see, in the street. He said, if something is exciting happens out there on the street, you know, like maybe a car wreck or anything, said, well, don't, don't look out that you might get excited and just die instantly. And then he went on to say, worry has killed more people. He said, there's more people in the hospital, more people are sick, more people are already dead than in the grave over worrying than any other one thing. Well, I guess he could detect, all right, that my mother and grandmother were world champion warriors, and I just sort of inherited that. Because I was not, wasn't all, only almost dead, I was about to worry myself to death, to death the rest of the way of worrying what was wrong with me, wondering what was wrong with me. And then when he left and told me I couldn't worry and to quit it, boy, I'll tell you, that put me on the spot. And so I got the feeling sorry for myself, and then here God got, he, 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 he got to working on me. And he began to deal with me about that sin of worrying. That's where my healing started. I began to get under conviction about it. Now, I surprise folks sometimes when I tell them I just soon cuss as to worry. Both of them are sins. We'll not discuss which one is the worst. If it's wrong, well, we oughtn't to do it. Are you hearing me? I want to show you what it means to be a doer of the word. So I remember about six o'clock in the evening. That day in 1933, I finally said to the Lord, I finally capitulated. I said, all right, Lord, I promise you from this day forward, I'll never worry anymore. I told you that I never doubt anything you read in your word. I read in your word. And the moment I understand it, I'd do it. And you see, I'd gone on by in Matthew 6. And up till then, God's word was light to me. But from then on, it was dark to me. Do you know why God's word's dark to a lot of you folks? You are not walking in the light you already have. 
If you go back and start walking in the light, God's word will become a light to you again. Just the very minute that I went back to Matthew 6 and started walking in the light, then the rest of the word became light to me. But after I went on by that, see, months had gone by. It took me three months or more to get out of Matthew 6. I went on reading, but I couldn't get anything out of it. Because, you see, I wasn't doing what I said I'd do. Well, somebody said, I didn't tell God I'd do that, though. Well, he expects it of you whether you told him or not. It'll work the same way with you whether you tell him or whether you don't tell him. Because that's just the principle by which God works, the faith principle. And so I said, all right, Lord, I promise you from this day forward, I'll never worry anymore. I'll not feel sorry for myself anymore. I'll never be discouraged anymore. I'll never have the blues. Now, folks, all that goes together. This blue day business has caused some worry and discouragement. And every bit of it comes from the devil. And bless God, 30 years have come and gone, and I've never worried anymore. Have you ever been tempted to? That's the greatest temptation I've ever faced. I've never been tempted with anything else, Mike. That's the greatest temptation I've ever faced is the temptation to worry. But I've never worried anymore. I've never been discouraged. I've never felt sorry for myself. No one has ever seen me when I couldn't smile. Praise God. Hallelujah. Or when I didn't have a good report. I've never been discouraged. Oh yes, I've been disappointed in a few people and so on, but never has it discouraged me one moment. Praise the Lord. Because God said, don't do that. Praise the Lord. Don't fret. Have any anxiety about anything. Didn't he say it? I said, didn't he say it? Sure he said it. Sure he said it. Well, God said, for us to be doers of the word, we say we believe the word, then let's do the word. Let's have corresponding action along with what we believe. And when we have it, it works for us. Praise the Lord. Now, it took me a long time to, to uh, get my wife out of that worrying habit. <laughs> well, she's here tonight, but she, she, she'll admit this is all true. So she did the word for a while, but she's quit a long time ago. I remember some preacher's wife was talking to her years ago. She said, oh, I quit that long time ago. She said, I used to worry, but I quit it. I remember she got angry with me one time over something when the children were real small. They were just babies, only 19 months between them. And so something, we came in one night and was going into the postage, and I had one child and she had the other one. And, and about the time we got into it, she said, I don't believe you'd worry if me and both the kids fell dead instantly. <laughs> and I said, why well, certainly not, I'd be a fool to start worrying them. Now, wouldn't that be the most ignorant thing that a fellow ever done? What good would that do? He said, which of you but taking thought could add one cubit unto your stature? Well, worrying, thinking about it wouldn't bring them back. Are you listening to me? Well, that would be most foolish. <laughs> well, I said that, and I think that made her matter than <laughs> But she finally saw the light. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. No, friends, it may be a little humorous, but yet it's true. So true. We need to understand these things. Thank God we can be doers of the word and not hear his own name. And when we are not doers of the word, then really we delude ourselves. And he said, but be ye doers of the word and not hear his own name. He said, deceiving, as I said a moment ago, the margin of the King James Translation read, deluding your own selves. Now you see, in, J in 1 Peter, the 5th chapter, and the 7th verse, Peter says, casting all of your care upon him, for he careth for you. I like the Amplified Translation here. It says, casting the whole of your care upon him. All your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all upon him. For he cares about you affectionately 
and for you, or for you effectually, and about you watchfully. Oh, God's word in life. Praise God, God's word in life. Hallelujah to Jesus. You know, I took a church, the pastor in 1939, that nobody else hardly would pastor. That's the truth. Because it was a church that had a record of having trouble. They had never supported a pastor in 23 years as a church. I'm the first pastor they ever supported. And I'd go to a fellowship meeting or to a rally. Some of the ministers told me years afterwards and said, we'd be standing around talking about our problems and here you'd come along just to smile and, and we'd say, well, how goes the battle? And you'd look at us and say, man, it couldn't be better. I don't have a care, I don't have a worry, and just go right on by us. And you'd stop and scratch your head, and I'd say, because I was the nearest pastor to you, and I knew some of the wolf problems, and I'd say, I know he's lying about it, he does. I know he does have problems. He's got the hardest church in the section to pastor, with the most problems, difficult people to handle. Besides that, I know him personally, I know something about his personal problems. He's got a widowed mother and a little brother he has to help see after, too. I know something about his financial problems, but no, he does. Somebody else said, don't believe he's got enough sense to worry. <laughs> Praise God. Thank God I've got too much sense. It's those folks that don't have very, very much sense that are worried. I'm talking about Bible sense, you understand, of course. I have too much Bible sense to worry. And if anybody, and if you had enough Bible sense, you wouldn't worry either. Because you'd do what the Word says to you. It seems to me that folks would be glad to get out from under the load. It seems to me that they'd just be thrilled to know that they didn't have to carry that load. Casting all your care upon him. The whole of your care. All of your anxieties. All your worries. All of your concerns. Do it every day? No. Once and for all, the Bible says. Once and for all. Now you see, friends, you may be praying about your problems and so on. But as long as you're going to worry about them, you don't have corresponding action, so you're defeating yourself. You're deluding yourself. God can't do anything for you. Are you hearing me? Though he wants to. Though he wants to, yet you're in a place where he can't reach you. You're sort of out there in no man's land, about halfway between God and the devil. And God can't reach you, though he wants to, and the devil can enter into your innermost council, and so he keeps you confused, and you're defeated are you still here? Amen. Amen. That's the truth. That's the truth. Well, now you see what I have done. Before I ever left home, I knew I had troubles. I knew I had worries. From the natural now I'm talking. I knew I had responsibilities and concerns. Oh, brother, if I had time, but I'd be ashamed to tell you some of them is in that church that I faced. And I knew something ought to be said. But I said, dear God, I don't know what to say, and I'm liable to say the wrong thing. And I know something ought to be done. But dear Lord, I don't know what to do, and I'm liable to do the wrong thing. So I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to preach the word and treat everybody right and turn it over to you. Because after all, you said cast it all your care, and this is my care. This is my responsibility. And I'm going to tell you, brother, we had a constant revival in that church for 18 months. No, I don't mean we run a revival service. I mean every Sunday in our regular service. People were saved, healed, filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God in every service. It just made such a difference when you put him to work in it and quit trying to carry it yourself. And I'll admit, they were problems. You see, this church had been there 23 years. And I was just a 21-year-old boy. But these folks had the baptism of the Holy Ghost longer than I was old in age because I was just 23 years old or 21. And they'd had the Holy Ghost for 23 years. And of course, you know, they wouldn't want to listen to me. They thought they knew more than I did, you know. And then not only that, but you see, it had been there long enough for 23 years until they'd, kin folks, you know, their children had grown up and married one another. And some of them had married one another again, you know, until they're sort of interwoven, you know. And, and you, you get into a few kin folks' problems and you get into something. <laughs> You know, they'll sort of fight among themselves, but if you told taking sides, they'll all turn on you. You better have enough sense to keep the mouth shut. 
And I'll be honest with you, there were times that I felt like on Sunday morning, just getting up, bless God, and starting out with the Sunday school superintendent, and, and then with the deacon board, and then with about half the teachers, and just, just blasting the whole bunch of them. But when I felt that way, even though sometimes I had another sermon always already prepared, I'd always turn over, most of the time, I'd turn over to Revelation 21 and 22 and read about heaven, preach about heaven. Or else I'd preach on love. Praise God. I remember again, when we first married, my wife didn't understand about divine healing. She hadn't been taught. She was a Methodist, you see. And so sometimes... Well, if she was sick, we would pray, and sometimes she'd miss you at Wednesday night services. Then I'd go to church and preach and come back home. My wife said, did you tell him I was sick? I said, no. Well, did you have him to pray? No. You didn't even tell him I was sick? No. I said, never even mentioned it. You didn't ask them to pray? I said, no. I thought we prayed for him, went to church, and claimed you as healed. That if I'd asked them to pray, I'd be undoing it. I don't have any corresponding actions left. Can you understand that? You know, a lot of folks think if you can just solicit enough folks in prayer and get them all to pray and it'll work anyhow. You've just got another thought coming, folks. That's not Bible. That's not scriptural. You're just talking yourself out of God's blessings and God's best. Are you hearing it? I said to her, no, I didn't tell him you were sick because I believe you're well. I didn't ask them to pray because you and me prayed before I ever went to church. And thank God for the answer. We claim we've got the answer. Then I just went right on to acting like I've got it. Hallelujah. <laughs> regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the influences about us, let us turn every problem into his care. Learn to put God to work for you. Praise the Lord. He wants to go to work for you. He wants to work in your behalf, but as long as you're going to hold on to these problems and try to solve them yourself, he can, though he wants to. Hallelujah. But isn't it wonderful to be able to turn it over to him? Now, your worst enemy is the flesh. Yes, sir, that's the truth. And the natural mind that's been educated through the flesh, through the physical senses. Because, you see, the flesh, the natural human reasoning, would limit you to your own ability. And so, you see, you would look at the circumstances, and you would look at the influences, and you would look at the problems and the tests and the storm and the flood and the rain and the wind, and you'd say, I can't, I can't. You see, the language of doubt and the language of the flesh and the language of the devil and the language of the senses is, I can't. I can't. I haven't the ability. I haven't the strength. I don't have the opportunity. I have no education. I've been limited. But the language of faith says, I can do all things in him which strengthens me. You know, that's what the Bible said. Paul wrote that to one of the churches. Praise God. Yeah, but somebody said, yeah, but Brother Hagin, Paul was an apostle. Well, just because he's an apostle, he didn't have any more strength than you got. I didn't give him any extra spiritual strength. I just gave him an extra burden and responsibility and ministry. You know, a strange thing, sometimes, sometimes people say, well, yeah, but you're a preacher. But I don't mean he strengthens us in our daily living any more than he does you. We don't have any more just because we are pastor, or evangelist, or, or a prophet, or apostle, or a teacher. We don't have any more to draw from than you do to put us over in life. We just have a ministry, and we have an anointing to fulfill that ministry, but that's all. We have to face the issues of life, the storms of life, and use the same weapons that each lay member does. Are you hearing me? Paul said, I can do all things in him who strengthened me. Yeah, but Paul's an apostle. I want you to notice something, though. He didn't say I can do all things because of the apostle. He said I can do all things because I'm in him, and you're in him just as much as Paul was. Amen. Paul wasn't in him any more than you were in him. Because the Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Paul wasn't any more a new creature and in Christ than you are a new creature and in Christ. He said, I can do it because I'm in him. <laughs> Hallelujah! Christ didn't belong to Paul anymore, but he belongs to you. I can do all things. See, the language of faith says I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Well, who is it that strengthens me anyhow? Just who is it that strengthens me? Thank God it's my very own Father, God. I can do all things through him. I cannot be conquered. I cannot be defeated. Oh, no, I'm not speaking from the natural standpoint. I'm speaking from the spiritual standpoint. And any natural force that can come against me came with me. Not because I'm who I am naturally, because there isn't enough force in all of this world to conquer him who dwells in me. You see, that's the reason why. There isn't enough force in all the world to conquer him who dwells in me. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'm fortified from within. Are you hearing me? I have strength, praise God, from within. Greater is he that's in me. I've learned how to put the greater one to work for me. I've learned how to put the greater one to work in me. Oh, praise God forevermore. Praise God forevermore. Not only am I born of God, a partaker of God's nature and God's life and God's love, but I have dwelling in me, God dwelling in me. I have the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwelling in me. I have God's wisdom. I have God's strength. I have God's ability in me. In me. Now I'm learning how to let that wisdom and ability and strength govern mine intellect. Letting him think through my mind. Let him speak through my lips. I'm daring to think God's thoughts after him. This word contains God's thoughts. It's God's word. I'm daring to say in the presence of all of my old enemies. You know, the 23rd Psalm belongs to us. And he prepared the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Oh yes, these enemies are real. But bless God, right in the presence of those old enemies, I'm daring to say in the presence of my old enemies, that old enemy of failure, weakness, want, lack of opportunity, and a thousand other enemies, God is my ability. God is my ability. God is my ability. God is my ability. Thank God he is my ability. He is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I fear? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Praise God. God has made me greater than mine enemies. Praise the Lord. God has made me put my foot, my heel, on the neck of weakness and fear and inability and I stand and declare that whosoever believeth in him shall not be put to shame and I cannot be put to shame now that should be your confession and my confession praise God my weakness is aroused the strength of God is mine I'm not trusting in my own strength somebody said I'm trying to be strong oh God knows I am well, stop it right now. Stop it right now. The Bible never said a word in the world about you being strong. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus and said, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That's not trusting in yourself and something you have and you trying something. Praise God. No, you say God's my strength. You're being strong in him then. He's the strength of my ability. Oh, so many people have got the wrong strength about this thing. 
You see, they're struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling, or trying to do something themselves. If I can just and finally somebody's finally come up, I don't know whether you heard it over in Oklahoma or not, but I heard him sing it in California and some other places and down in Texas and finally somebody's come up with the old unbelieving song, you know, if I can just make it in. You don't know whether I can or not, but if I can. And so folks will get up, bless their hearts, and testify if they're over here in Oklahoma and Texas, well, they'll say, y'all pray for me. If they're out in California, they'll say, you guys pray for me, thou hold out faithful to the end. And up in Pennsylvania, among the black Dutch, they'll say, you ends pray for me, thou hold out faithful to the end. God don't want you to hold out. You're trying to do it yourself. Let him do it. Just swing free. Praise God. Hallelujah. Wrap yourself in the promises of God. Praise the Lord. I use this illustration very often. It happened in 1937. You probably remember that. In Akron, Ohio, they was trying to moor one of those dirigibles that the government made during the Depression, about three of them, you know. I saw on the front page of the Dallas Morning News they had that thing that's trying to moor it to a steel mast. And they had about 200 servicemen on these ropes holding the thing down until they got it tied to this steel tower. But something happened. The thing suddenly shot up in the air. Some of those fellows had present mind enough to turn loose from those ropes. Some of them didn't. Well, they tried to hang on then because it's so far away from the earth. And so some of them turned loose and fell to the earth and broke their arms and their legs. And there were several of them, 37, I believe, all together that were killed. And a great number of them were injured. About 60 some odd of them were injured. But there was one that just kept hanging off. In fact, that thing went away up in the air, almost out of sight. And they could see that fellow look like a little toy soldier up there swinging on a rope. Well, women screamed and kids cried and people hid their face because they knew he's going to turn loose any minute. And when he does, why, well, he'll plummet to the earth and every bone in his body will be broken. But 15 minutes went by. I mean, after all the rest of them had fallen, he's still swinging there. 30 minutes went by and they could still see him swinging. 45 minutes went by and they still saw him swinging. An hour went by and he's still a swinging. And they thought, how in the world has he done it? And they was just a cringing, you know, and just trying to hold for him. You could just see them, you know. And a picture there in the paper, you could see the look on their faces. Well, an hour and 45 minutes went by and he's still a swinging. Finally, somebody got back there and began to pull that rope and got, a hook, got it and pulled him up into the gondola. And eventually they came back and moored the thing to the mast. They took him down. They had an ambulance waiting there to rush him to the hospital. They know he's given out. And he said, oh, I'm all right. And they examined him, found him. Well, 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 how in the world? Everybody else fell. Some held on, but they couldn't hold on. How did, how did you hold on so long? Why, well, he said, I didn't hold on. He anything. He said, when I saw, I was too far away from the earth to successfully let go. I knew I'd be injured. He said, I had to hold that rope. There's about four feet of it down here. I held on with one hand and threw the other end of the rope around my waist and tied it. I didn't hold it. It held me. And there they were, you see, just a crying and a screaming. And, and you could see the intense look on the face. And some of them are gripping their fists, you know, trying to help him, you know, hold on. And him just a swing and free enjoying the scenery, having a big time. <laughs> and you know that's the way so many folks are. In this Christian life, they're trying to hold on and hold out till they've given out. And some of them turn loose and fell. When they need to do is just wrap themselves in the promises of God and swing free. And enjoy the scenery. <laughs> Whoa, praise God. Amen. They should go along. And then again, some folks are sort of like the... Uh, Story we heard, I heard this first in a Baptist church as a little boy. My feet wouldn't even touch the floor as I sat in the seat. We've heard variations of this illustration, but it still illustrates what I'm saying. So many are going through life, burdened and carrying their own load. They sort of like the fellow you know is walking down the railroad track, had a pack on his back and a valise in either hand, and he ran onto the section gang repairing the railroad. Well, the section gang foreman standing around there directed the work. He saw this fellow. He just moved over to speak to him, pass a few words with it. The fellow thought he was going to put him off the track. So he set his suitcases down. His pack was still strapped onto his back. 
fist around in his pocket and said, you can't put me off here, I've got a ticket, and showed him the ticket. The man said, why, that don't give you the right to walk down this track. He said, you can be riding the train, check your baggage in the baggage car. And a lot of folks are on the way all right, they're on the right track, but they ought to be riding instead of walking. <laughs> Praise God. And then not only that, friends, but they ought to check the baggage. They don't have to be carrying it. Jesus said, God said, cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Oh. Praise the Lord. Isn't that right? Sure, that's right. The strength of God is mine. The ability of God is mine. Praise God. Now, that's faith speaking. And that's corresponding action. And you can look the devil in the face and tell him. And look circumstances in the face. And act upon God's word. And he'll go to work for you. Praise the Lord.